Hi folks, Wooden Boat Dan here. Just wanted to give you a heads up. The podcast you're about to listen to was recorded several years ago. So some of the phone numbers, email addresses, website, links, and time-sensitive information are no longer valid. Please keep that in mind as you listen. If you'd like to contact me, my email address is woodenboatdan at gmail.com. Thank you and enjoy the podcast. Welcome to Hooked on Wooden Boats weekly podcast episode number 57. I am your host, Dan Matson, a.k.a. Wooden Boat Dan the Man. If you can't do it, nobody else in the wooden boat world can. <laughs> and this is the world's first podcast, fully dedicated to celebrating the art, craft, history, tradition, and romance of wooden vessels of all sizes and shapes and ages and colors, construction methods, draft, beam sail rig, you name it, if it's got wood in it, on it, under it, over it, or through it, we want to talk about it here on Hooked on Wooden Boats. Welcome to the podcast today, folks. Great to have you. If you're a first-time listener, you're in for a great time. Today's featured segment is, you can hear my phone beeping in the background. Somebody just left me a message. I'm uh, Actually, I'm sitting in my car. On my lunch break at Bayview State Park, not quite as nice as it was uh, two or three weeks ago when I was out working on my tan. I'm in the car now, a little wind in the background. But anyway, the featured segment today is with John Harris of Chesapeake Light Craft, or CLC Boats as they are known. Uh, CLC Boats is a pretty large, very large uh, boat kit manufacturer for small boats. I had a great interview with John recently. I'm going to play that today, so hang around. It's going to be a lot of fun. This past week, I didn't really get anything at all done on my canoe. As I mentioned before, we're getting ready to put our house up for sale, and we're getting rid of a bunch of stuff. And I've actually been selling a few tools. I sold a joiner that I bought in 2003 that I'd always had wanted a joiner, thought I would use it a lot, and I probably used it you know, six times or whatever, and getting rid of some other stuff. So that's been consuming a lot of my time, but I will be getting back on my canoe here soon. I did make a trip to Port Townsend Friday and did three interviews over there. Had a great time as usual. Spent some time in the boat shop at the Northwest Maritime Center, which is always a fun place to hang out, see what people are working on. There was a couple scamps in there that are being built that are probably two-thirds done. A gentleman named, named Lloyd, who was at the August Scamp Camp, and Simeon, who's uh, actually written the manual, I believe, for building the scamp. He's building a scamp of his own and customizing it, so that's pretty fun. And then uh, Sean Rankins and Robert Darcy were there working on a spitz gatter that Sean and his wife Inger own. Yeah, I'm going to have an interview of that coming up here pretty soon. So it was a great time. I'd like to give a shout out to our new subscriber, Edwin Steckley. Edwin, welcome to the monthly e-news list. I'm getting ready to send out a letter here with some fun stuff in the next couple days. So if you haven't already subscribed, please go to hookedonwoodenboats.com forward slash subscribe. Give me your first and last name, email address, and I'll shoot you a newsletter about once a month. Uh, This upcoming one's going to have a lot of fun stuff in it, including the launch of Hooked on Wooden Boats YouTube channel and the first video uploaded there. It's going to be pretty cool. So stick around for that or sign up for that. That would be awesome. Well, I got a really cool email this week I thought I'd read to you. Uh, This is from, uh, i got to pull it up here, Scott Walker. Scott is a graduate of the 2012 class of the Northwest School of Wooden Boat Building. And here's what he has to say. First of all, Dan, thank you for what you're doing with this great podcast. I'm Scott Walker, one of the 2012 grads of the Northwest School of Wooden Boat Building, and I've been loving your program. I'm the second engineer and ship's diver aboard the University of Hawaii's RV 
Kalmikai o Kanalua. <laughs> Some kind of a Hawaiian name anyway. A 222-foot research vessel out of Honolulu. I spent a lot of time getting my wooden boat fixed from you while I'm working in the engine room of the big steel boat. Thanks for helping keep me in contact with the peaceful world of the wooden boat while I'm out here. It's nice to let my wan my mind wander to a quiet boat shop when I'm up to my elbows in hydraulic fluid. Keep up the great work, Scott. Hey, thanks for the feedback, Scott. Really appreciate comments, questions, things like this. I guess it wasn't a question. It was a comment. So that's pretty cool. Thanks for writing in, Scott. I would encourage other listeners out there, if you want to connect with me and give me some feedback, I would really love it if you called my voicemail feedback hotline, VMH, if you will, for short, and leave me a voice message there that I could play on the podcast. That number is 424-261-2360. 424-261-2360. If you're listening to this podcast and you've never built a wooden boat, it's high time you get out and do that. Building a wooden boat is an absolute blast. It doesn't require a lot of skill. It just requires some patience and time. And when you get done, you've got something really fun that you can use. I recommend you start small, maybe even buy a kit boat because kits are faster to put together. You get a little more uh, product satisfaction quicker that way. And if you have questions about what boat to build or how to get started or other things like that, uh, shoot me an email, dan at hookedonwoodenboats.com. Okay, we're going to move on to the interview with John Harris of CLC Boats, Chesapeake Light Craft. So let's roll that now. Take it away, John. It is September 7th, 2012. I'm sitting with John Harris at Chesapeake Light Craft. John, welcome to the show today. Thank you. It's great to have you. We're sitting here on the beach at the Wooden Boat Festival in Port Townsend, Washington. It's a gorgeous day. There's boats sailing by. It uh, doesn't get any better than this, huh, John? Well, you're not going to get much out of me of this interview because I'm just going to be looking at the boats <laughs> going by. Sorry. So it's a beautiful day here. But anyway, John, so uh, tell me about your youth, where you grew up, and the boating you did when you were a youngster. Uh, I grew up in Aiken, South Carolina, far inland, uh, the son of a uh, boat and sailing obsessed father. Oh, uh, really? He, and, and he still is. And. Uh, uh, we sailed on inland lakes in South Carolina in his snipe and sunfish and other small boats. And um, he was a guy who built things. Uh, he's an engineer, still still builds things. And uh, uh, I grew up thinking it was perfectly normal that when you needed a piece of furniture, you went out to your shop and built it rather than going to the store. So um, uh-huh. when I got to be uh, older, 12, 13, 14, then, uh, and I wanted my own boat, um, then it, it seemed normal to me to... Uh, to just build my own boat, and mm-hmm. I did. Mm-hmm. And uh, I became addicted to the process of designing and building and stuck with it all through my teenage years, all through college, and uh, uh, was building boats right out of college. So tell me about that first boat you built, John. What was it, and how did it go? And I, I, <laughs> I, I hesitate to say I designed it because I think that would, that would ascribe too much formality to the process that actually <laughs> went on, but... Uh, it, it was a rowing shell. I, I, I was and am very into rowing, and uh, and I, I, I built my own rowing shell out of Lawan plywood, and um, it was um, a lamentably terrible rowing shell. But it did float and it did hold water, and and uh, and it did work after a fashion, uh, you know, as well as a as a rowing shell with furniture casters for the for the wheels on the sliding seat and. Uh, you know, uh, pieces of a old TV antenna for outriggers uh, could nice. do. Yeah, um, no, but it, but it worked, and, and like I say, I was addicted. I still have uh, actually the bow of that of that boat, which I keep in my office. Just the uh, bow? Yeah, I, cut I, bow I, I cut it up. I cut it up. You know, I think I'm, uh, uh, you know, five or six later, years later, because I was afraid somebody would uh, would would drown in it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> then I would be responsible. It was it was a substantially terrible boat, but uh, but I really was addicted uh, at that moment. And um, yeah, so how long did it take you to build that, John? I you know uh, 
six weeks or something like that. Yeah, yeah so one summer you, in between. You kind of put you know, it together yourself, or do you have any plans or anything? Uh, or? You know, I drew up some plans and you drew it up yourself. Uh, yeah, yeah, I drew it up and stitching um, glue, or how did you put it together? Yeah, you know what? Uh, I could. I was too poor to to do stitching glue. You know, stitching glue, you've got to buy a epoxy and fiberglass and yeah. And um, you know, I had a budget of, of essentially zero, but you know, maybe a yeah. hundred dollars total. Really? Uh, you know, at the end of the day, and um, so uh, it was just uh, you know, chine logs and uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, Did you just and, uh, use some kind of a marine glue on it? Then, I or? think I used resorcinol glue mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. you could get it at the hardware store down the street yeah. uh, at that time, yeah. and um, and it was six, you know, it was eighteen dollars for a quart or something like that. But that yeah. was. But a court would go a long way in a rowing shell, so... Uh, yeah. Yeah, so I, I, I keep the bow, and, I, and I, I use it in demonstrations and things as, as, a, as an example of how not to build a boat. Mm. It's a reliable mm. laugh line at, at yeah. you know, events like that. So, so what was your second boat, John? Well, uh, the second boat um, was a, uh, a Phil Bolger-designed uh, little rowing boat, rowing pulling boat beautiful little double into thing and um i was i was two years older and smarter and i, I um and it, it was and is a, a very nice boat in fact the, the man who bought it from me um is now a facebook friend and uh, oh. uh you know it's funny how things go and, and he uh after he was married they they departed the wedding in the boat it's really cool oh really you know, you know so that boat is still going, as far as I know. It's a little uh, rowboat, you say? A little, yeah, a little double ender. Uh, oh, a double ender. A, a, Phil, a Phil Bolger design that many people know called a teal. Okay. It's just kind of two sides and a bottom, uh, with an uncommonly good-looking shape. And uh, mm-hmm. uh, I've built more of those over the years, actually. Really? Yeah. Now, was that stitch and glue, John? Uh, no, no, it was still kind of chine, chine logs and, okay. and that sort of yeah. thing. You know, once again, I, I think that. You know, my budget had had gone up. Uh, you know, maybe to two hundred fifty dollars. So yeah. I think the bottom panel was marine plywood. Oh, really? And that pretty much shot my budget. So the sides were Lawan <laughs> and and uh, what you buy at the hardware store. Yeah, and and the uh, and you know I think I used plastic resin glue, having again spent all my money on the res- uh, on the one sheet of three eighths inch yeah. marine fur. Um, I, I used plastic resin glue, which was pretty flimsy, and I think yeah. I had to reduce some of it. But okay, uh, but it was nice. I, I put little decks on the end, and uh, it was all. Uh, it was a proper little yacht for a 16-year-old, and I um, I, I fitted it out as a camp cruiser and would go uh, on long rowing expeditions up uh, up nearby rivers. This by, oh. by now living on the Chesapeake, and um, and would camp aboard and oh, um, fun. and and that started a a lifelong wow. fascination with beach cruising and camp cruising out of tiny boats yeah what year was that you built that boat that would have been in the mid 80s mid 80s so, okay. yeah, yeah. Um, and, and you're uh, still in maryland you're just on the river yeah now. so yeah my family had moved to delaware by that time and oh, so we okay. were we were playing in boats on the chesapeake and then uh, uh, i was i was drawn to the chesapeake to the extent that i, I picked a college uh, on the shores of the chesapeake called washington college and, yeah and went there uh, and built uh, boats uh, holidays and weekends and um so what did Summers, you study in yeah. college, John? Uh, I was a music major. Oh, interesting. Music major. Yeah, I, I met another that. guy, an instructor down at the uh, Wooden Boat School here, Sean Kuman, who was also a music major. Yeah. And he went know, into boat building. Um, I, I've met a lot of musician boat builders, and, and near as I can tell, um, we all decided that two half jobs might make a whole job. You know, <laughs> music, music on, uh, you know, music and boat building. Um, right. So, right. Uh, that's. That's why there are a lot of uh, musicians uh, yeah. with day jobs, like yeah. building boats. But so you got a four-year you know. degree from there. Well, I did get music. a four-year degree, and yeah. Yeah, really, the, the the reality is that um, you know you can't get a four-year degree in boat building, and um, uh, but I, I got a li- in essence a liberal arts degree at Washington College, and yeah, uh, and it was probably one of the few really smart things I've done in my life because having a liberal arts degree like that is the perfect foundation for someone who wants to start a small boat building company and, uh, you know it uh, uh, you have to know how to write and you have to know how to communicate and you have to know how to research and, and uh, it really was a, uh, a, a, a the perfect fit Good for preparation. me and, and it was you know right there on the shores of the Chesapeake Bay and I, so yeah. I spent afternoons sailing on the sailing team and uh, Working in oh, the fun. in the in the college boathouse uh, uh, every summer. Oh, they had summer. a boathouse there too. They had a boathouse, and, and my nice. job in the summers was to maintain the college boats, and uh, and so I was around uh, 
that sort of, of, of boat. And I, you know, so I, I was able to build up a, a, a really a, a pretty decent and well-rounded portfolio by the time I graduated from college. And, and uh, uh, my first job was at a ye olde traditional boat shop building uh, lap strake this and, and, and carbol plank that and cold molded that. And, and uh, Oh, really? Where was that at? That was in Chestertown, Maryland. Okay. And, um this boat shop was pretty busy, um, hungry and poor, but busy, and doing all sorts of fascinating things. Again, great, great portfolio material for me, uh, and, and a lot of interesting experiences. Uh, and uh, over in the corner of this shop was a subcontract to make kits for a fledgling company called Chesapeake Lightcraft. Huh. The company at that time was just one guy, Chris Kolchitsky, and, and uh, he was working out of his house and, and doing very well selling kits and plans. And he was having uh, us build these kits. And, really? Uh, after... Um, CNC machines? At no, that time? no, this was before CNC machines, yeah. or at least before they were a commodity that yeah. that that you know mortals you like you and me could, could go out and buy. And, and uh, they were made on a, on a pattern router. Uh, and... Uh, that grew very quickly, whereas the ye olde traditional boat shop was always out of money and like couldn't make payroll a lot of time. And, you know, <laughs> I was keeping the books for that little company, and I oh, noticed you that were. you know the only <laughs> business here making any money was the Chesapeake Lightcraft contract. So I, I got, I finally got laid off at some point, and and, uh, uh, and I jumped in my car and I drove to to Chris's house and said, you know what, I, I think that we could do better than this. And, and, and Chris, um, bless him, ha- had a better suggestion. He said, you know what, why don't you just come to work for me and, and we'll, st- we'll open up a shop and, and bring all this in-house. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and so we did. And um, so we opened the shop in Annapolis in 1995. If up till then it was in his house or garage yeah, or Yeah, and, and, and over at this other boat shop, okay. uh, you yeah. know, about, a, I, I guess, 80 miles away or something like that. And, uh, yeah. So uh, that was 1995, and uh, right at that moment uh, be- began or the, the ascension of the uh, of the craze for sea kayaking uh, was getting underway, hmm. and uh, and we were doing sea kayaks, so it was it was a good fit, and and. Uh, what was the my first model that you guys were selling at the first? Well, I few? guess the the one that everybody knew was was a uh, was a kayak called the Cape Charles, which was oh, a, okay. was a fairly basic machine, kind of two sides and a, and, and and two you know bottoms and uh, and a, a very simple deck and uh, and it, it was uh, it couldn't have been really any easier to build and and uh, it had been on the cover of Wooden Boat magazine, which had had ignited a furor at the time. So, so, for better and for worse, I'll say. That's all I'll say about that. But the the um, uh, but the business grew very smartly uh, right through the '90s, and Chris made a series of of, uh, of very smart uh, business decisions and marketing decisions. And uh, and, I, and by the end of the '90s, I think we had nine or ten employees, and uh, wow, uh, and and a, a big industrial size CNC machine, and. Um, and uh, a whole bunch of space in Annapolis, and, uh, and wow. it was doing very well. Yeah. So back up just a little bit, John. When did you get more serious about designing boats? Was that when you were real young? Or uh, you know, I think I, I you know, I got really serious around age five or so. Oh. And, and by the time I was eight or nine, you know, it was I, I was absolutely certain that I wanted to be uh, designing boats in some wow. in some feature. And I. You know, I guess I thought it was very weird at the time because nobody else had the slightest interest in that. And I, uh, <laughs> and, and your friends probably and I suppose, what you, were you know, doing, right? you're looking back on it with with 35, 40 years of, uh, of of introspection, it really was weird that I knew exactly what I wanted to do, and yeah. from the age really of 12 or 13, was focused like a laser on doing what exactly what I'm doing right now. Wow! And wow. you know, I guess that. It's helpful to know what you want to do, be, yeah. Uh, but it wasn't helpful for my school grades or anything else because I didn't really understand why I needed to do all these other things and 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 get good grades and so on because um, I knew what I wanted to do, so um, I didn't need to be bothered with yeah with academics or anything else. So I, I always had really lousy grades in school. So did you learn by trial and error, John? Did you do some reading? Did you learn from other uh, people? Yeah, I read. I, I read. I read books by the hundred, by the thousand. By the ten thousand, I, I, I had a um, 
I, I had a uh, an appetite for boat books that continues to this day, and, and you can just only ask my wife, who uh, you know, we just went through yet another round of bookshelf building at the house uh, to try to accommodate my really? my collection, and uh, and that started very very young. Uh, and uh, any books stick uh, out that you at a young age it made a big impression on you in, in designing and stuff, or well, curious, uh, you know, I would say that. You know, when I was in maybe eighth grade, I discovered the work of Phil Bolger, and mm. uh, y- you know, it was uh, it was like being struck by a meteorite for me. And, and you know, I, I I don't think that my boats look like Phil Bolger's boats, but um, his um, the example that he set of uh, of always starting with a blank sheet of paper, always needing to rationalize why you made certain design decisions, um, uh, not not truckling to uh, tradition or to um, or to aesthetics, uh, unless it didn't matter, uh, you know, to the design, you know, unless it's something that you could add on without ruining the design. But uh, his his example of uh, of rigor in scholarship uh, and study of of the of what really mattered for this particular design on these particular waters uh, has made a profound. Uh, difference in the way I, I look at boats and, and understand boats. So he was really focused on the function of the boat. Yeah, of course. I mean, yeah. you know, I think that Phil Bolger's detractors say, well, you know, he always designed very functional boats. And, and Phil Bolger's promoters and admirers say, well, Phil Bolger always designed very functional boats. And, uh, you know, I whenever I, I set pen to paper, uh, Phil Bolger taught me to ask, why am I doing this Mm -hmm. if it's already been done by somebody else then just tell the customer you don't need to spend a lot of time designing a new boat for this Mm. Uh, you know it already exists out there if if you are doing something new then it ought to there ought to be a reason why you're spending all your time and trouble and uh, and you ought to say something new with the design otherwise you know i I hate reading you know just rehashing anybody else's work right right yeah so you started uh, that at a young age yeah. And then uh, you were working for Chris, uh, and you got up to eight or nine employees in the late 90s or sometime around there, and then what happened, John? Well, uh, Chris was, you know, it became very much like a business, and, you know, you'd have to ask Chris what his motivations were, but, but I think that once it, once it became very much like a business, he was ready to go start a new business. And, uh, uh, and uh, you know, I, I thought that, that Chesapeake Lightcraft's work had only just begun, and, and was um, I, I loved my job, and I loved... Uh, uh, the I love the fact that I could go in and mess around with small wooden boats every day and, and somehow get paid for it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it is, really. I still marvel at it. I mean, even this moment, I'm pinching myself as we're having this conversation. But yeah, uh, so you know, I thought this was something that that I could build on and that I could bring uh, my own insights to. And um, it is a very different company now than it was then. But uh, yeah. I, I rounded up investors and bought the company. Uh, and uh, what year was that, John? That was, uh, you, you know, I guess we closed the deal in December of '99. So. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and so you kept the name there. and the employees. Most of the employees stayed there. And yeah, yeah. I mean, it, you know, I, I guess that there was a certain inertia for a little while, and then uh, I, I set about making some course corrections that I um, and, and changes in focus. And you know, my my interest was really in trying to make boat building more accessible to people who had never contemplated building a boat. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the whole amateur boat building thing has been around for over 100 years, and I've done some research and written some articles really? about Really? That long? About, uh, about the, the, the whole go build your own boat thing. And, uh, you know, as it exists in a modern marketplace, I mean, of course people always built their boats you know, for, for all time, you, you know, for, for, for millennia, but but the idea of marketing to uh, the first-time boat builder was something that really got going with the Rudder magazine in the first part of the 20th century. And uh, you can you can go look at advertisements there for you know boat kits and things like that. Uh, really, it's fascinating to see how similar the boat kit market and the boat plans market was in say the 1920s to what it is now. Wow, I have, I have no some, idea. I have some beautiful catalogs that I've collected. Uh, from the from that time, and uh, it's really striking that you know the more things change, the more they stay the same. And um, then, as now, 
there were terrible boat kits and terrible boat plans, you know, ones that separated people from their money, and then the kit or the plans arrived, and you were pretty much on your own. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the parts didn't fit, and the, and the instructions didn't make sense, and, the, uh, and, uh, and you know, that's something that's still true, lamentably. But uh, my, my focus at Chesapeake Lightcraft was to try to, to, to make sure that, that when you built your very first boat that you didn't have to build a boat that was steeply compromised uh, to make it easy to build. That you could build something that was extremely sophisticated in terms of performance, uh, but still extremely easy for someone who's never even seen epoxy before. And, uh, so uh, that was the plan. Huh? You know, now, the execution, uh, you know, th- that was certainly what I, 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 I thought. But you know, and we've come light years from those early days when, you know, from Chesapeake Lightcraft, you would get three kind of inky uh, blueprinted plan pages of plans and a pamphlet, so to speak, of 17 or 18 pages, you know, with not many photos. And right. um, now, a, a, uh, a, a our, our newer models are, are coming out with instruction manuals that are 150 pages. 200, 250 pages long with spiral bound with thousands of photos and drawings and uh, and they are demonstrably easier to build uh, along uh, along the way we've gotten much smarter with computers and so um, you know the the Mill Creek kayak which you built 12 years ago yeah. um, it was stitched and glued and it had the same fiberglass schedule and it was uh, you know the same shear clamps but now the difference with that boat is that um when that kit arrives, instead of having to align scarf joints, now you have these things called puzzle joints, mm-hmm. which are self-aligning, and you don't need to have a set of plans at all. Uh, in fact, the latest versions, you don't need to even own a tape measure because things like bulkheads are located in the kit by CNC cut notches and uh, and mortises and tenons, and and so it's really we're getting wow. closer and closer to that. Ideal More like of, a puzzle of, of like IKEA a... IKEA furniture, you know, something like that. You know? Yeah, yeah. Um, IKEA furniture only not made out of park wood. So. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. we're getting smarter with that kind of thing all the time. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, the, that's the that's the good news. The bad the bad news is that um, whereas in say 1997 we could introduce a new kit in a couple of weeks, uh, you know, basically recycle the instruction manual from another boat and and uh, you know the the actual quality of the 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 fit of the parts was shall we say uneven at best um the uh, the modern kits now uh, will build five six seven eight prototypes uh and we'll have beta builders you know people who quietly build boats for us around the country and give us feedback months before the kit actually really comes out interesting like, like so, beta software well just like beta it. software yeah. yeah and you know these these are people who are privately unsparing in their criticism and, and uh, uh, it's an expensive process now so now the kit rollout really requires something more like a year uh, to 18 wow. months for a new wow. so so you know we'll, people will notice that we're working on something in the shop they're watching the shop cam or whatever and they'll yeah. see something interesting and and then it gets on a bulletin board someplace people start talking about it and say well can we order that now and i say well maybe in a couple of months and then a couple of months turns into six months and then turns into ten months <laughs> and, you know so that's just the, the speed at which things go now but yeah on the other hand the kits uh that you can get uh, these days are amazing and, and how tight they fit and, uh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and how well they go together and uh, yeah. uh, and, and that's the future uh, the future is that you're going to be able to build a boat that will startle people with how pretty it is and uh, uh, how high performance it is relative to to something you can buy off the shelf and mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. cool, uh, yeah, cool. What so uh, what year was the company started John? Uh, you know, it uh, it was you know Chris was selling plans I guess around 1991 or 92. Okay. Uh, I think the company assumed its current form around 1994. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah, yeah. And you were saying earlier when Chris sold, one of the reasons you bought was that you wanted to keep your job. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that was the way to do it was to buy the company. Well, yeah, that, that's a, you know I guess. You know, I was 27 years old, and uh, with the benefit of many years, I, I doubt I'd have done it, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, 
you know, um, I got called a lot of things, including naive, and I, I just, I, I, would, I would disagree with that strenuously because naive suggests that I had many choices and chose the wrong one, but, you know, I just really had one choice to keep doing what I was doing, and that was to buy the company. Yeah, so, good for you. There was nothing but the but the, to to, uh, to push forward, and, uh, and so, that was an interesting So process. how many different uh, models do you offer these days, John? We have over 100. Over 100. Wow. Uh, and, and, so and, you expanded uh, way out uh, of kayaks to yeah, all Yeah, we really did. Stuff. Some of that was What's through some of the acquisition. What's stuff that you're yeah. doing now, John? Uh, we, we acquired... Uh, oh, you did? Uh, it, it, uh, the rights to produce kits for Guillemot kayaks, oh, which yeah. is Nick Shada's outfit. And also, uh, before that, for his brother Eric Shada's outfit, Shearwater kayaks. And, Those uh, are strip planked or partially strip planked. Uh, yeah, uh, there's, they have a, they have a lot of both. Uh, yeah. And and you know I think we we kind of tripled our offerings overnight um, in a couple of years. Overnight in a couple of years. That's a good one. You'll edit that out, right? Yeah, exactly. There, right? It's been a long day. The, the sun's been beating on my <laughs> yeah, head all day. It's warm okay? out here. Yeah. Right. I'm, I'm sure you'll fix that in post. But anyway, um, so lots of different boats there, and also. Um, there's been a steady drumbeat of new small craft designs. These are rowing and sailing boats uh, that we really started with in the late 90s and and really got going with uh, in the last 10 years. So mm -hmm. these are small sailboats and, and rowing boats, and and, um, and uh, that side of the business has been incandescently popular. Mm -hmm. uh, can't make them fast enough. And, really? Uh, so do you sell um, more non-kayak boats than kayak boats? Uh, no, or? the kayaks are still the number one thing. Are they? Uh, okay. Absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. you know, but by a pretty good margin. But yeah. uh, they're easier to manufacture. So, oh, are they? Uh, so we're always thinking about the small craft because the, uh, you know, just the pile of wood, the pile of parts is is, uh, is so much bigger for a 17-foot dory than it is for a 17-foot yeah. kayak. Right. And, uh, and it's a real challenge to make that affordable and to make that uh, buildable yeah. and um, for us to be able to get into a box that we can ship. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So out of all the boats you offer, John, how many of them are your design out of the 100 boats, roughly? Uh, gosh. Um, maybe two dozen or, okay. or, or 30 of them, something like that. Okay. I've never sat, sat down and counted, actually. Oh, really? Okay. Something yeah, I ought to do that out when you get yeah, back. Right. Yeah. yeah. So about 30 of them are your design. Uh -huh. So that's very cool. What's your most popular kit these days? Is there one that's... What's our most popular kit? Um, well, as of this moment, September 2012, uh, we're selling stand-up paddleboard kits um, like ice cream on a hot day. Is that and right? Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. Really? Yeah. And you're shipping products all over the world? We do, yeah. yeah. We have uh, dealerships in um, uh, around the world that have CNC machines. So Australia oh, yeah. and, uh, and the UK... Uh, have CNC machines, and um, I think our German dealership now has access to a CNC machine, so they're cutting uh, our kits. Wow, under, I didn't realize you were doing that. Right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, the, the shipping issue. I mean, I think that we would just continue to be direct from um, from Annapolis, except that that shipping into Europe or shipping to Australia is obviously uh, an enormous challenge. Expensive and time-consuming. Yeah, probably, huh? and you know, uh, when we when we're able to find the right people who appreciate what we're trying to do and appreciate um, the the challenge of, of getting a kit together, uh, the uh, uh, it, it just makes sense to to uh, have somebody else do the marketing and all that. Does it make sense for you guys to have another a distributor on the other side of the U.S. at all, or? Uh, not the way things are working right now. I mean, not to yeah. say that that might not happen sometime. And we, cer we certainly have, have have talked about it. We do have an agent on the West Coast, Larry Froley, who handles all of our surfing-related designs, uh, like the paddle boards and, mm -hmm. and the prone paddle boards. And uh, mm -hmm. he's a ha has consulted on those designs and uh, uh, and uh, and goes to shows on our behalf on this coast. So. Uh, mm -hmm. So we, we were doing that in a small way already, but right now the shipping, uh, you know, it costs just about as much to ship from Maryland to California as it does to ship from Maryland to West Virginia. So, mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. uh, right now, uh, for the moment, we'll keep that in house. Yeah, very cool. So uh, if somebody's listening to this, John, and they've never built a kit boat, it's, it, describe to them what that's like and what the cost range is and how long it takes, if you don't mind. Uh, our, our range of kits uh, start around seven hundred fifty dollars, and and ranges up into uh, you know around two thousand twenty five hundred dollars for the larger 
the, the most popular of the sailing craft. Now, that being said, uh, we, we have some model boat kits that are very inexpensive, and uh, we have a, a 31-foot proa that's, you know, the... A, a, a base kit package for that is something like twelve thousand dollars. So, and that's um, a, the trimaran. That it's, a, it's a proa, you know, yeah. a, a, okay. a, a two holes. Oh, it is. Uh, okay. But that's that's not something that that you know uh, we're selling scores of. But you know, our our most popular small sailboat, the Northeaster Dory, is seventeen feet. Uh, once you have all of its options, its sailing rig, and all of those bits and pieces added in, it's about twenty. Two hundred to twenty-four hundred dollars, and um, our most popular small kayak, the Wood Duck Ten, is starts around seven hundred fifty dollars. Okay. Okay. And what comes with the kit, John? Uh, well, you get all of the the uh, marine plywood parts. This is Okumi or Sapili, or often both. Uh, it's British marine, Standard Ten Eighty Eight. Yeah, this is That's the real Ten Eighty Eight stuff. stuff. This is the most expensive stuff. Uh, yeah. We don't we don't spare much money on the. On the plywood, uh, we actually pay quite a bit more than market, I think, for some of the plywood because the the cost of a kit builder having a problem with the quality of the plywood uh, is so. Uh, That's a problem, isn't it? it it's gonna, you know, we only need one or two boats to to uh, delaminate or something like that to uh, for it not to be worth us buying so, discounted plywood. So yeah, exactly. Uh, so we basically, uh, it, it's essentially custom made plywood for us. Uh, it's made in France by a company called Jumeir. Uh, and uh, then you get, of course, the epoxy. The epoxy is the single most expensive component in the kit. Yeah. Um, you know, it depends on... Uh, that's an unusual vessel, don't you think? Yeah. yeah it's a sort of a hybrid between a kayak and a stand-up paddleboard. Yeah. And I think and it's made out of pink styrofoam. And the guy's kneeling and paddling it. Yeah, it's a little of everything. <laughs> that's why I love Port Townsend. Wow. Only in Port Townsend, right? Yeah, exactly. Well, so uh, so epoxy uh, comes in the kit, uh, fiberglass. You get all the hardware you need. You get, uh, in the case of a kayak, you get a seat and foot braces and deck rigging and hatches and bulkheads and, and that sort of thing. Uh, all the little fiddly bits. In the case of a sailboat, uh, if you get all the sailing components, then you get uh, the Sitka spruce mast and blanks and the hardware for all that and line and so the mast is um, built and the mast is 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 started for Assembled. you it's, it's started for okay. you you've got to assemble it uh with scarf joints and then, okay and then finish the shaping on it and um, okay you know i we certainly could shape masts for you at chesapeake lifecraft but it would add a thousand dollars to the kit and yeah it would, it would, it would add right. you know Right. Ridiculous amount. So, yeah. uh, so we, you know, but people are having no trouble getting those uh, sorted at home. And, and um, uh, you know, uh, all the hardware. We try to keep this in packages so that if you wanted to build just the rowing boat and then add the sailing rig a year or two later, you can do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then what doesn't come with the kit, though, is the finish. If you, you decide on your own finish, varnish or paint, is that right? Well, we don't know what color you want. So, right. exactly. uh, so we've not included uh, varnish yeah. or paint. And, uh, uh you know, you know, we the instruction manuals hold your hand and walk you through that decision uh, yeah. that you'll make yourself on on how you 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 want to finish your boat. Yeah. So uh, whether it's going to be all varnish or all paint or something in between. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Yeah. But everything else, anything else you need to purchase? I probably some supplies. Well, you, need, you know, if you're building paper. a kayak, we don't include the paddle, and if you're yeah. building a rowing boat, we don't include the oars. Mm -hmm. um, if you're building a power boat these days, we don't include the engine. So. Yeah. Um, that's uh, that stuff that you'll need to add. Right. So, John, you did, did you design the pocket ship? I did yourself? design that. Yeah, it's a 15-foot microcruiser. It's a little pocket cruiser, uh, yeah. 15 feet on deck, about 19 feet overall with a long bow sprit. And yeah. uh, it has a keel center board uh, with lead ballast. And uh, we've shipped, uh, as, of, uh, as of this moment, we've shipped... 41 of the kits, I believe. Wow. Which is probably, I would say, uh, something like 35 more than I ever thought we would. But it, really? It seems to be That looks uh, like a really popular. sweet boat. Yeah, it's great fun. And, uh, you know, again, it's it's a, a very sophisticated boat with uh, a lot of performance that's nevertheless accessible to uh, an amateur boat builder. Mm -hmm. And we don't, we don't market this to first-time boat builders, although I note that a lot of first-time boat builders have built pocket chips but yeah. you would want to have some command of tools and um and and carpentry and cabinetry and especially uh, epoxy right right so for one of your more basic kits john for a first-time builder how many hours do you estimate i know that's a real broad 
question. Well, but, let, uh, let's take a boat like our, our, you know, one of our most popular kayaks is a, is a 12-foot kayak called the Wood Duck. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that is a boat that takes about 80 hours. Uh, and it takes about 80 hours if you're a seasoned professional who's built 60 boats. Or it takes about 80 hours if, it's, if you're a rank beginner. And I'll explain that. Uh, this is something I've noticed over the course of shipping 24,000 boat kits. Um, and that is that everybody takes around the same amount of time. They just spend it differently. So a, a professional <laughs> a professional is going to build the boat in a real hurry. They're going to be done with that boat and with that wood duck kit in four and a half days, five days, six days, you know, whatever. It's going to yeah. take them no time at all to assemble it. And then... They're going to obsess over the quality of their finish. They're going to sand for a lot longer than the, the beginners will sand. They're going to spend a lot more time um, uh, on, on the, the, the varnish and, and, and all of that work uh, because, you know, that's frankly, that's pretty hard. Uh, and, and they know that it just simply takes time to bring up a really beautiful finish. So, Interesting. So there, they may be 30 hours of construction and, and 50 hours of finish work. And then the... the uh, the rank beginner will will be after the uh, the, the the instant gratification of a, of a kayak that comes together very quickly, you know. And they're going to spend all their time uh, basically slamming it together, and you know the joinery may be a little bit dodgy, and the um, you know and 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 they're going to see this boat built and sitting in their uh, in their garage, and they're going to say, you know what, I want to go put this in the water and go out right now, and uh, and, uh, you know, they'll slap a pretty ugly finish on it. So they're going to spend, you know, instead of 30 hours building, they're going to spend 50 hours building it and 30 hours finishing it. I see. Interesting. Yeah. So, you know, we, this is something we make a real study of. We ask people, how long did it take you? Really? Yeah. Really yeah. how long did it take yeah. you? And, and so we get a, you know, we get a good long average when you ship five or 600 wood ducks. And, and, yeah. Uh, and, 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 and people tell you. Well, this is how I so some take 120 hours, you know. Yeah, right. But they were, but they're not the beginners. They're always the people who, who really made a, uh, they, they made something special. They, mm-hmm. they they customized the deck and, and put beautiful inlays or something like that. So right. Something right. that I endorse and enjoy seeing. Mm-hmm. And hope that more people. Are yeah. So I'm building that 12 foot sassafras from the book, John, right now, and I'm I'm 80, courageous. 80 courageous. hours into yeah. it. Okay. That includes. Uh, and you're bolters, just stitching it up, right? No, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still scarfing the hole. And no. you're just scarfing the. No, the, actually, the, it's the all it's the it's all built, and I got uh, epoxy on everything, and now I'm getting ready to paint the hole and varnish the decks in the interior. So right on. I okay, figure that's okay. Maybe. Yeah. Well, I mean, since you you had to make your parts from scratch, and I did. The yeah. lap stitch boat, so you had some molding work on the on each yeah. flank, and yeah. you had to do all the layout. Uh, yeah, and I did so, what yeah. I did on my decks is I did a kumi on top of the gunnels, but I trimmed it with purple heart. Oh wow! A splash in around the edges, and that took me a lot of time. Well, I hope you send a photo. I mean, yeah, see, this I'll is do. exactly the kind of thing I'm talking about. Yeah. I, I love seeing the, you know, when 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 people do tasteful embellishments. I mean, mm-hmm. I've seen a few that you know I left me struggling to say something nice, but um, but the. Uh, you know the ones that that have uh, really tasteful and em- em- why, why build your own boat if you can't make it first exactly right? yeah. yeah so i'm having a blast doing it i i started in january and i wanted to be done by may and i'll hopefully be done before the end of the year which will be the shortest time i've ever built a boat in so that's good now, i have uh, boats that i started uh eight years ago that are still <laughs> really? you know yeah. 40 hours into it so <laughs> i still have them you know, so uh, how many boats do you have personally john too many to count. Uh, you know, I, you know, it's part of growing up. I ha- I've actually trimmed my personal fleet a little yeah. bit down to the boats that I actually use. I have a. Uh, uh, I just sold a boat actually. I, I, I sold my uh, my folk boat, which was a. Oh, um, you had a folk boat. A, a, a fiberglass folk boat. Oh, built really? Built in Sweden. Really? That I, that it's I a lap double ender. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's a, it's actually it's not a double ender, but it's the okay. same same sort of thought. Um, yeah. Scandinavian in, yeah. in origin, and uh, it, it was built in Malmo, Sweden, and I. I bought it for a song uh, and uh, and spent a lot of time restoring it um, back in 2003 and 2004 and uh, had some fun and then um, then started having to pay marina bills for it so mm-hmm. I've, uh, I've, I've sold that one and um, now I have of course uh, Madness the Proa which you can read all about on our website yeah and I've probably seen on the web if you spend any time looking yeah, at yeah I've seen that that's a fast and, um, boat right 
Yeah, that's that's sort of the the, the anti folk boat, and uh, yeah, uh, it's you know a, a twenty knot sailboat, and, and really, really fun without a whole lot of accommodations below. But yeah, but that's uh, I have that one now, and okay. it's uh, sitting uh, on the Y River. I have a uh, I have an Eastport Pram. I have Eastport Pram number one. Okay. Uh, the first one built, uh, a design I'm very proud of, and I have one it's in my backyard. It's a little backyard. sailboat. It's a little dinghy, eight foot dinghy. Yeah. yeah. With a sail. Uh, with a sail, yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's great fun to sail. I have a uh, a Phil Bolger teal that uh, uh, I, I helped a college roommate build, so it's really it's his, but it's it's stashed at my house at the moment. Yeah. I have a uh, magnificent Ian Autra designed Willy boat. It's oh, a really? 15, 14 and a half, 15 foot double ender, lap strake, not stitching glue. It's a glued lap strake boat. Yeah. Not a beginner's boat, but you a, built that, John. I did not build that. Oh, okay. I, uh, I, I bought it at a boat show. I had, I had been admiring it for years, and uh, then it came up for sale, and uh, I snatched it up. Cool. Uh, and uh, and that's a that's a, a lovely and inspiring boat. I have a couple of uh, little sailing canoes designed uh, for me by Phil Bolger, uh, a really? custom design that uh, they're sitting in my backyard, and uh, uh, it was a really neat experience to be involved with. And, uh, yeah. Uh, that's it at the moment. That's it. Which boat yeah. do you use the most, John? Um, you, you do know I just had a baby. So yeah, <laughs> I don't that's use right. any boats right now. Ella's yeah. 10 months old. So. Yeah, I have a 10 month old right now. A year so. ago, what boat yeah, were you using? Yeah, the most? well, I use the Willy boat <laughs> some for rowing and, and, uh, and sailing. On, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, I do a lot of rowing and sailing and paddling with Chesapeake Lifecraft's fleet when I'm at shows like this oh, okay. yeah. there's a lot of need for demos I do a lot of you know prototype testing so I spent you know, I've spent uh, you know probably 50 or 60 hours in the last um, couple of months in a new powerboat that I designed called the Pilo Skiff uh, just running it up and down the river and basically trying to break it uh, trying to find out where its uh, flaws are. So I, I spend a lot of time in prototypes. And, really? Uh, you know, in terms of taking recreation in boats, I, there hasn't been much of that in the last 10 months, I can tell Yeah, you. yeah, uh, yeah. But, so most of most of the time, I'm in a, a lot of time in kayaks uh, at CLC, uh, either prototypes or um, or photo shoots, you know, mm. out photo shoots for magazines or whatever. I, yeah. You know, that can take all day. Oh, and, okay, uh, and, yeah. And, paddling back and forth in front of photographers. So yeah. it's not sexy, but somebody's got to do it. Uh, Is your wife a boater too, John? Well, certainly by default. She, yeah. she, yeah, she spends a lot of time in boats with me. I, yeah. I, I had just built Pocket Ship when we were dating, actually, and um, and we had a lot of fun uh, cruising in that boat uh, up and down the East Coast from Maine and, and Massachusetts and uh, in on the Chesapeake. Uh, oh, really? Lots and lots of time uh, in that boat. Uh, so I think she, she, she considers that boat... Um, uh, you know, you know, uh, honorarily uh, her own, and uh, and I certainly think so. Yeah, she christened that boat. So. Right, so very cool. Cool. So, John, for people listening that want more information about your boats and stuff, what should they do? They should go to our website, okay. clcboats.com or okay. chesapeakelightcraft.com. Uh, it's a great place to explore. Uh, be careful if you visit there while you're at work. Um, you're going to lose some time because we have lots of videos and lots of fun things to. To look at and see uh, we have a bulletin board there that's been going since the late 90s um, which makes it an old bulletin board by internet standards and uh, and that's a great place a great very civil uh, and interesting and fun place to gather uh, um, uh, free of flames and trolling and uh, uh, a lot of experienced boat builders there uh, that you, you can you can interact with um, we have of course the ever uh, popular shop cam which is a live um, feed into our boat building shop and classroom uh, and um, I know a lot of time has been wasted in cubicles around the world <laughs> uh, watching that yeah uh, if it's dark it means that you're not in our time zone so. yeah right. uh, and uh, uh, we have uh, 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 tens of thousands of photos of uh, from customers and from our own boats there on the website and we do know um, because we can track these things that's that's where uh, everybody spends all their time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good. Well, I can personally attest that your website is awesome as a resource because I've looked up a lot of stuff on there, finishing a boat, well, epoxy, you. all kinds of stuff. It's been great. So uh, anyway, congratulations, Sean. Thank you. you got a really cool company. 
Uh, so we're going to wrap it up here today. Any parting comments you'd like to make to the listeners today? Well, you should build a boat. You don't have to build a Chesapeake Lightcraft boat. You should build any boat because building a boat is a, uh, is, is a, is a great, great way to synthesize all of these art forms and uh, uh, sculpture and engineering and science and um, and you can go on adventures in this boat you built and uh, it will change your life so i hope you build a boat any boat some boat sometime in your life very cool all right well thanks for your time today john appreciate it okay Thanks, John, for taking the time for the interview. It was really fun to sit down with you and find out what you've been up to. Uh, you got a really cool company. Yeah, great boats and fun stuff. So thanks again for the time, John. Really appreciate it. If you'd like to find out more about John's company, go to clcboats.com, and there's a ton of information there. It's a great place to do some exploring, find out more about building a wooden boat, find out about kits, lots of great tips and videos and things on there that are helpful even if you're not building one of their boats so go for it next week is an interview with casey cronkite casey is from port townsend washington she was the director of the northwest or the wooden boat foundation's port townsend wooden boat festival for 10 years up until a year ago she owns a 45 meter Spitzgatter, and a 45 meter boat in a Spitzgatter uh, is the actual sail area, not the length of the boat. I believe the boat is 30 or 32 feet long. Had a great interview with Casey, so come back next week for more about that. Please connect with me by sending me an email, dan at hookedonwoodenboats.com, subscribing to my monthly newsletter at hookedonwoodenboats.com forward slash subscribe. Uh, leaving a comment on my website, hookedonwoodenboats.com. You can also find me on Facebook under Wooden Boat Dan, and you can like me there. And you can send pictures and stories or call my voicemail feedback hotline at 424-261-2360. Also, if you're listening to this podcast directly from your computer... You can subscribe to the podcast from your MP3 player. Actually, if it's a smart MP3 player, as in an iPod, uh, iPod Touch, or from your smartphone, or from iTunes directly, you can subscribe to the podcast. I would encourage you to do that. That way you get a notice each week that a new episode has been published. As I mentioned before, I publish this each Thursday. And uh, we're 57 episodes into it now, so that's pretty cool. If you'd like to support the show and you buy stuff at Amazon, if you do it through my website, I get paid a small commission of 4%. So the way you would do that is go to my website to the resources page, click on any Amazon product there. That'll take you to Amazon's site. And then buy any product on Amazon, and it tracks that the purchase was through my site, I get paid a little bit. Same thing can be done through Jamestown Distributors, which sells marine and boat building supplies. I have a banner of theirs on my home page. If you click on that and make a purchase at their site, uh, you will generate a small commission for me there also. And I have personally have used their products and uh, they have great shipping, uh, fast shipping, great prices. So I would encourage you to go there if you get a chance. You could also leave a five-star review for the podcast on iTunes. That would be pretty cool. You can sign up for my podcast through Stitcher Radio, S-T-I-C-H-E-R. Also on the website, if you click on the store button at the top, you can purchase flip-flops, coffee mugs, t-shirts, hats, things like that with the Hooked on a Wooden Boat logo. Thanks for your support on that stuff. Well, I hope you have a great week. Again, if you haven't built a wooden boat, get out and do it soon. It's really a blast. And if I can help in that process in any way, shoot me an email or leave me a message on my feedback hotline. I'd love to hear from you. Thanks for all your support. Keep the bright side up and the barnacled side down. Wooden Boat Dan, over and out. Have a great week.